Hello and welcome to Radical Candor, a podcast from Panoply and Gretchen Rubin's Onward Project about how not to hate the boss you have or be the boss you hate. I'm Russ Laraway, co-founder of Candor Inc. and career-long operational manager across the Marines, Google, and Twitter. And I'm Kim Scott, also co-founder of Candor Inc., former executive at Google and Apple, and CEO coach at Twitter, Dropbox, and a bunch of other great companies. I'm also the author of Radical Candor. Available now. Please buy a copy. Okay, in today's episode, we're talking about the thing that everyone loves to hate, meetings. Ugh. (laughs) <laughs> but we think we know how to make them better. So along the way, we'll talk about, one, an opportunity you as the boss may be missing in your meetings. Two, we'll answer a listener question about annoying meeting habits that both bosses and their employees are sometimes guilty of. And three, we'll finish with tips for better meetings in our candor checklist. Here we go. First, we want to talk about meetings and how they relate to feedback, a topic that we love, as you know by now. Joining us for this first part of the episode is Claire Johnson, COO at Stripe and a great friend of ours. For those of you who don't know, Stripe is the easiest way to handle all your payments if you're running an online business. I also used to work with Claire at Google. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. Thanks, Kim and Russ. Claire, you have a great meeting story from many years ago when you worked at that uh, media consulting business. Your boss was named Paul. And Paul taught you some very important lessons about how to conduct yourself in a meeting. Can you tell us that story? So the story that I share often with people, especially new managers, Mm -hmm. is this story. I So I'd worked on this project, selling this project, which is a little bit over my skis in terms of my abilities at that time as a consultant. And then... So you were probably nervous. You were selling something. I was super nervous. No, I had done it. We did it. We sold Mm -hmm. the work. Mm -hmm. And then we had to build a project team and a project plan. And because of various things going on with our new office, but also the economy at the time, I got the opportunity to be the equivalent of the engagement manager, which I really was, again, a big assignment. And it was equivalent of essentially managing a huge team. And you had never done this. I'd never done this before. I had managed people early in my life in political campaigns, but really nothing like this set up with a huge client who's like a Fortune 500 company. And the COO actually was our, our client. And we had an incredibly complicated project we were undertaking, and I got to be in charge of it. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. It was actually a lot of pressure, and I was into it. I mean, this was my ambitious self at its best. And Paul gave me actually a really good pep talk on what mm-hmm. kind of opportunity this was, how I should think about it. We had a good sort of diagramming the case situation. And then he said, now let's get the team together and I want you to give me an update after you guys have kicked off some of the work streams. So I was working my butt off, super motivated. I had a couple of associates who worked on the team. The project had a technical element. So I had sort of a lead for the technology work stream. We built a huge project plan. We did the research. We started doing the analysis. We did a technical assessment. Like we had the milestones documented. We were hitting them. Time for the update to Paul. So you are working hard. I'm working you're hard. Kicking, you're kicking ass. And you're not, I think we're on track. You guys are knocking out of the park, it sounds like to me. Well, I thought that. I was very confident. I'll <laughs> okay. be honest. Um, and I had been working around the clock. And so we had an update. And I'll never forget. We was in this sort of conference room that was a little bit of a casual setup. So you move the furniture around depending on what. And so we kind of pulled a bunch of chairs in this room in a circle. And Paul said, OK, I'd like an update on the project. Please walk me through each of the work streams and where they're at. And I proceeded to talk for, I don't know, 45 minutes and answer his questions on each work stream and where we were at, you know, get his feedback. And I was super proud. And each work stream, I bet, was going really well. They were all, it was a beginning, but they were all going very well. And we had laid out sort of the key elements we needed to start with. And each of them existed. I had work product to show him. I had analysis to show him. And he was nodding and he was asking questions and we were having a great, you know, sort of update meeting, I thought. You, you sort of finish up and you feel great about how this went. I feel really good. And Paul says, hey, Claire, can I grab you for a few minutes in my office? I'm thinking this is the big congratulations. Yeah, you're, like, you're waiting for your high five. You are ahead of schedule and you are do- following you're exactly what we talked about in living up to the expectations I had for you as the project leader. Instead... Paul says, yeah, have a seat, have a seat. And he says, so tell me, um, what do you think Trisha was thinking in that meeting? And I'm thinking, Trisha? (laughs) Trisha was a great (laughs) new associate just out of college. She had done a lot of the research elements, which is what associates often do, some of the early analysis. 
And she's very actually quiet person. It was her first meeting with the big boss. Like I was like, "Ah, I think Trisha was fine. So moment of truth. Were you thinking, Uh I don't know, or were you thinking, who the hell cares what Trisha thinks? I was thinking this is leading somewhere (laughs) that I better figure out pretty damn fast. Um, I was still kind of like, okay, I think she's fine. I complimented her work to him. I said, she's actually doing really well for her first project. He said, what about Doug? And I was like, Doug, Doug is a technical lead who had done all the technology assessment, who frankly had expertise that I didn't have. I was very reliant on Doug for success here. And I said, Doug delivered his work on time. Seems, you know, fine. And Paul is looking at me and he said, you know, I would like you to go around and talk about each person in that update meeting and what you think they were experiencing in the update meeting. (laughs) And and now I'm really getting it. I was like, oh, 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 oh. And so I, one, I hadn't observed very closely what were those people experiencing in the meeting because I was very focused on myself and what I was. You had a lot to say. And I had a lot to say. And also they didn't really participate in the meeting. So I ended up having to talk about their work product and contribution to the meeting. And he said, you know, I think Trisha was looking for some recognition. And don't you think it would have been a good idea to compliment her work as you just did? So luckily I'd done that to him yeah. in front of her. Or maybe it, even let her present it. Yeah, it was feeling. Oh, that was the other. Doug, re- he said, Doug really wanted to present his work, don't mm-hmm. you think? And I was like, yes. I mean, of course, the guy is the expert. Right. I, am, I don't even know what I'm talking about on that work stream. <laughs> and he and Doug is sitting there impatient. And yeah. Paul is reading. Paul has very high EQ as you're picking up. Part of why he's an amazing salesperson is he can read a room. And you think about team buy-in. This is a project team that I don't directly manage because that's consulting structure, right, that was about to execute our most important project. And he said to me, I'm not sure they're going to be excited to work with you as a leader. Wow. That's hard to hear. I'm not sure they're going to be excited to work with you. Yeah. So what did you do next? I really had to go to school on how to be a more inclusive project manager and leader. I, to this day, when I sit in a meeting, I have like a reminder playing in my brain, don't forget to read the room. Yeah. And I spend a lot of time coaching people on the meeting is not about you. You know, if you're in that room, there's a reason you're there, but it's usually not about you. And what do the other people need? And what are they looking for? And so it's about management, but it's also about really being excellent in the workplace. Yeah, it's about caring personally about yeah. each person sitting around the table. And the amazing thing about the story, Claire, is that you're one of the most empathetic people I've ever worked with. Like you do care personally about the people you work with, but it's easy when you become the boss and you're responsible to sort of totally, stray from that core human value. You totally lose sight of it. And I will also say, and Kim, you know this about me as well, is I like to get the stuff done. Yeah. Right. And I can be very like action item yeah. oriented and that dark side comes up and you sort of look at the people as tools to get it done. To get it done. And you completely forget the side of they're humans. Yeah. And you're not gonna get those things done very well if the humans are not enjoying the process. Yeah. Claire, can you talk can you just talk a little bit about the value of him deciding to give you the feedback immediately after versus maybe waiting a week or buttoning up the feedback or really like talk to me yeah. a little bit about the difference there. I mean, everyone gives us advice and no one follows this particular advice about giving the feedback immediately in the moment. It was huge. He immediately took time. He's a busy guy and said, we need to really talk about what happened here. I knew how serious it was. And I was also feeling still that. I mean, Kim was getting at this. I was so excited about how well I was doing. But, you know, realizing that there was a complete disconnect on my impression of what success was and his view of what success was going to be. Uh, for the project needed to happen in that moment. I think if he had waited, it would have felt, um, you know, you sort of do this thing, managers chalk some things up and they wait till the one-on-one and they say, hey, you know, in that meeting where we had the project update, you really could have been more aware of what the team was, their their role in the update and wouldn't have been as strong. This is such a great story and it makes a couple things really clear. One, meetings are a great time to see your direct reports in action. And when you're watching someone in action, you'll likely see something that is worthy of feedback, either praise or criticism. Two, leaving a meeting where you've just seen a feedback-worthy behavior or work product is a great time to grab someone for immediate in-person feedback, so right after the fact. 
Claire, your boss did such a great job with this, offering radical candor by challenging directly and showing that he cared personally. Your boss really helped you remember that a meeting is not just about accomplishing some work or giving an update. It's about developing a relationship with a bunch of people in the room. So if you're not doing this already as a boss, take a page out of Paul's book and start using your meetings as a time to watch for things you can give feedback about and use the time in between meetings as an opportunity to grab somebody privately for just a couple of minutes to share that feedback. Claire, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story. Thanks, guys. Thank you. This is great. If you have a story about giving or receiving feedback after a meeting, please email us at podcast at radicalcandor.com or leave us a message at 2626 Candor. Coming up, we'll hear from a listener who is experiencing one of the worst meeting bad habits after the break. All this month, we're asking you to tell a friend about a podcast that they will love. Did you know that there are still tons of people out there who haven't yet discovered the magic of podcasts like this one? They don't know about all the amazing shows that they're missing. It's really sad. You can help them see the light, though. Right now, just think of somebody you know who would love podcasts. Grandmom. Yeah. Or mom or uncle. Think about a podcast that they would love to listen to. Maybe it's Happier with Gretchen Rubin. Maybe it's Side Hustle School with the great stories about people working on their wild and crazy dreams. Or maybe it's another show entirely. Regardless, you know a show that they would love. So you got it? Now go tell them about it. And if they don't know how to listen, offer to show them how. Don't forget, I had to send my mom four screenshots to get her to listen to her son's podcast. Four screenshots. Got to go above and beyond sometimes, folks. Now she's listening, though. And now she's listening. So tell us what you shared with the hashtag tripod. That's T-R-Y-P-O-D. Hashtag tripod. Very clever. And thanks for spreading the word. There are a lot of bad habits that people have in meetings. But the one that we're going to talk about now has got to be one of the most aggravating ones. I know I can't stand it. It's interrupting. Here's a question we got from a listener named Elizabeth. I have a question for you that has been plaguing my mind for a while. I work as a nurse at a busy hospital in a leadership position. The two bosses I directly report to are notorious interrupters. (laughs) I cannot finish two sentences before being interrupted and asked many questions that would have been answered if she had just let me finish. She gets off track and insists on asking questions in between anything I say. At times, I end up listening to her talk for the whole meeting and never get the issues addressed I originally came to her office for in the first place. I leave feeling unheard, frustrated, and misperceived as my boss never really hears me out. Any recommendations on how to handle a serial interrupter? Boy, do I feel your pain, Elizabeth. It's one of my one of my biggest peeves. I cannot stand to be interrupted and you know, try to walk the walk a little bit. I darn near will never interrupt others. Um, just a little fun fact, by the way, I actually had to break this habit of not interrupting for this podcast because part of what people like is the interplay between Kim and me, and it turns out that interrupting each other is kind of a tool that helps us to have a little bit better dialogue and a little bit better interplay. So, but getting back to your question, in the meeting, and this applies regardless of the size of the meeting or who's doing the interruption, here's how I would handle interruption. The first thing that I do generally is I'll let the interruption happen and I'll take a back seat. The basic mindset that I have here is this person thinks they have something very important to say. They're probably not even aware they're interrupting and there's probably something for me to learn here. But, I'm still holding on to the idea that I know that I need to finish and get across. And I make sure I fully hear them, make sure I understand them. And then if the idea that I have is still relevant, I always make sure to get it out at some point in the conversation. You don't get mad. For me, it's just a little easier to take the back seat momentarily, but stay committed to making sure that the idea gets to market and gets articulated. Now, the problem, of course, is if the interruption is incessant, which is what it sounds like is happening for Elizabeth here. and At that point, it becomes time to give a little bit of feedback about the interruption. 
And so what this might look like is a separate conversation, just to be really clear, not in a moment of frustration when you just got interrupted. That's not really the best time. But what I might say just a few minutes later or even in a separate meeting the next day is something like, listen, I have a concern about the degree to which you interrupt me in meetings. When you interrupt me somewhat constantly, it leaves me feeling unheard, misperceived, frustrated. It just feels like you never hear me out. And often I leave our meetings not having resolved the things that I felt like I needed to resolve. I think that's completely fair feedback to give someone if they're constantly interrupting you in meetings. I don't know. Kim, what do you think? Absolutely. I think that's great advice. Also, I'm going to give you some advice from an interrupter. Part of the reason why I interrupt is that I'm enthusiastic about what the other person is saying. I'm trying to show that I'm engaged. That's why I'm talking. And I didn't realize, once people explained to me how often I interrupted, I didn't realize that my enthusiasm was having the effect of shutting the other person down. Because in fact, what I was trying to do was open them up. So give your boss maybe a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they're not trying to shut you down. And when you explain to them that they are, they'll do something differently. Look, as a person who despises being interrupted, I'm also aware that I can take a little while to get to the point. And one of the things I would look at, you know, this is advice for you directly, Elizabeth. Is that potentially something that's going on in your conversations with your boss? Now, I'm not excusing the interrupting, but if you just think about it for a second, imagine that you are sort of slow to get to your point, and maybe that's a point of frustration for your boss. I think maybe doing a little self-analysis there. Remember, we always say here that you know you have to be the change you want to see in the world. Just maybe take a look at yourself first, and then maybe even ask your boss if maybe the reason they interrupt is because you're slow to get to your point, and, and then maybe practice bottom-lining, um, summarizing your points just a little bit better, getting to the point more quickly. And then the last thing for everybody, if it is your boss who is doing the interrupting, as always, tread with caution when giving feedback. And so just make sure you follow the advice that we talked about back in episode eight, which was how to give feedback to your boss to just manage your risk a little bit and hopefully make sure that your feedback lands really well and you get to a successful outcome. Absolutely. Interrupting really is a bad habit. And remember that if you do give your boss this feedback, you're going to help your boss get better at breaking this bad habit. Furthermore, if you are an interrupter and you do it, it can be a hard habit to break. If you want more advice about this, email us at podcast at radicalcanner.com. We talked about the great connection between meetings and feedback and about one of the most annoying things that happens in meetings, interruptions. Now let's get into this week's candor checklist for some specific tips that you can put into action right away to use Radical Candor to make meetings more productive and less like getting stuck in traffic. So tip number one, have an agenda. <laughs> it seems have... obvious, and yet I am terrible at agendas. This is one of the reasons I love working with you is that you will set the agenda for a meeting. Uh, I wouldn't say you're terrible at agendas. It is an easy thing to forget. But we get a fair amount of listener mail that's about something like this, and it's kind of shocking how infrequently real meetings, formal meetings, do not have an agenda. So first is a good agenda item has a title, a brief description, and an owner, a person who's responsible for that agenda item in the meeting. A good agenda item has a time limit. It's okay if you blast past it. It's okay if you end a little bit early, but it gives everyone a sense for the scope or depth that you're planning to discuss something. And here's the most powerful thing I think you can do in an agenda. Label the goal of each agenda item. This is similar to what we discussed in episode six. We mentioned this idea of debate or decide for an overall meet a meeting itself might have one objective, but it's also possible to have a meeting, have multiple agenda items, each with different objectives. Possible objectives include solve. The intent here is to come in and problem solve as a team. Decide. It's clear that the intent here is to make a decision. And finally, is just relate, which is really just about relaying information to people like, hey, performance reviews are coming up next week. I think that's exactly right. I think every agenda item will go much better if everybody knows what the purpose is of that item. Are you going to decide? Are you going to debate? Are you going to relate? Are you going to solve something? What are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. Cool. All right. Tip number two, assign roles for the meeting. There's lots of roles that you could have in a meeting, but I'll throw out three. 
for the overall meeting, who's the facilitator? Right. Who's the person that's trying to drive the discussion that facilitator? You could have a facilitator for the meeting. You could have a facilitator for each agenda item, like the owner of the agenda item might be the facilitator, et cetera. Second is a time cop, someone whose job it is to keep an eye on the clock. And if you've budgeted 20 minutes, a person who says, hey, we're halfway there, we're 15 minutes there, we're 20 minutes there. And then the team can make a conscious decision. Should we go over? Should we snip this off and take it offline, et cetera? And then last is a note taker. Really important, I think, to take notes if you can project them so everyone can see the notes that are being taken and what's being discussed and to document if there are any follow-on action items and things like that. There's another couple of roles you can add. If you feel like your meetings tend to be ruinously empathetic, if everybody's sort of agreeing with people all the time, assign somebody to play the role of devil's advocate to grab a, a gavel that says duty to dissent and to push people to challenge. If you feel like your meetings tend to get really tense and be sort of obnoxiously aggressive, like assign somebody to call time out and go get tea. Just watch the mood in the meeting. Love that. Tip three, Kim? Tip three, think hard about who needs to be there. You don't want to have too many people in a meeting. At the same time, you don't want a bunch of people who are not in the meeting to feel sad and bad and left out. And I think one of the things that can really help is if you publish the notes for people who weren't there, then all of a sudden people don't need to go to the meeting just to be in the loop. You need to go to the meeting if you need to participate in the conversation. So be very careful about who's invited and make sure you get just the right folks in the room. And make sure you get the people in the room who are closest to the facts, not the people who are the most senior in a hierarchy. That's a disaster. That is absolutely a disaster. Don't forget, you can revisit the tips by going to the show notes for the episode at RadicalCandor.com slash podcast. If you have more questions about improving meetings or particular meeting challenges you'd like our advice on, please email us at podcast at RadicalCandor.com or leave us a voice message at 2626Candor. And that's it for Radical Candor this week. Our producers are Kristen Meinzer and Jennifer Lai. Thanks also to Laura Mayer and Andy Bowers of Panoply, and of course to Elise Lockhart at Candor Inc. Our theme song is written and performed by Cliff Goldmacher. Please let us know what you think of the show. You'll find us on Twitter at Candor. Our email address is podcast at radicalcandor.com. If you like the show, please be sure to tell a friend. Also, make sure to subscribe to us in iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app so that you automatically get each new episode. No work. Uh, and don't forget to leave us a rating or comment wherever you subscribe. It does help other people discover our show. I'm Kim Scott. And I'm Russ Laraway. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>